Now, in this segment, we're going to be covering configuring the system. Let's go over what it tells us about. FSTAB. Network information. More network information. The hosts file, which is more network information. And then the root password. Accidentally hit the right click, but that's okay. So, the first part is creating the fstab file. Well, doesn't really tell you this, but uh, you go to cd slash etsy and you do a ls, you can see fstab already there. I know it's pronounced fstab. I call it fstab because that's how it's spelled. F stab. Let's use the nano editor to edit FS tab, or as I like to call it, F stab. It gives you a few examples of how FS tab is supposed to be structured. And wouldn't you know it, here, it also gives a few examples of how FS tab is supposed to be structured. We're going to copy these. And once again, I hit Control Shift C. Control C, Alt Tab, Control Shift V. What are we going to do here? We're going to change that to SDA2. We're going to comment this out for the time being. However, I can tell you right now that this is going to be SDB1. We don't have that partition set up yet, which is why I'm not bothering with it right now. However, everything else falls in line with what I would expect. Defaults, no A time, and no A time right here. Except for one thing. No auto. I do not want the boot partition to be automatically mounted. This is just a matter of personal preference. If you've got regular users, you don't really want them seeing the boot partition. So. The FS tab has been built. Next up, well actually let me go over what the uh, FS tab does. This basically tells the system where you want individual partitions mounted, whether you want them automatically mounted or otherwise. And if something says no auto, it means it will not automatically mount that particular partition. Now. If you have a different partition that you want enabled, like let's say slash dev slash SR0, which would normally be the optical drive, and you want that mounted on slash MNT slash optical zero. I'm going to comment this out right here because I do not want this to actually be there. You want it to automatically choose the file system, as it does on this line right here. Furthermore, you want it no auto and read only, because that's how optical drives usually work, is in a read only format. And you put zero of zero right there. Obviously, I do not have that mount point set up. Save modified buffer? Yes. Sure. Why not? Now, there is a way to set this up with... Let's go back into FS tab. You see this line right here has uh, UUID. That's actually set up with this. 
right here. Now, it gives you a partition UUID for each of these. And basically what you would do is you would take the partition UUID and you would place it right here. Actually, no, that doesn't look right. Those are all the same. My apologies. I do not have much experience using the UUIDs to actually do this particular procedure. I usually use the device names. However, this part right here will give you an idea of how to use the UUIDs in addition to whatever else you might want to use. Basically, using UUIDs will cause it to act such that the partition that you are mounting will mount regardless of what system it is on. You could move the hard drive or SSD as is the case with a lot of systems these days, especially this system right here. You could move that drive to any other system that is processor compatible and you would be able to boot off of that partition regardless of where that partition is. And it would properly mount regardless, again, of where that partition is. We have partition UUID and actually, no, there is some difference between the two. Because this one's 8A, this one's 8F. That's SDC1 and SDC4. SDA1 has 88B5. This one has 85CB. So yes, there will be a difference between the part UUIDs. Additionally, like I've said, I do not have much experience using the UUID method of mounting file systems. However, like I said, that particular method will cause it to mount the file system regardless of what system it is, what particular port it is on, so on and so forth. Now, let's go to the host and domain information. This is under networking information, of course. It tells you to go to nano etsy slash conf dot d slash hostname. So cd conf dot d would help if I put the n in there. And you'll see hostname is right here. So hostname. It defaults to localhost, however, I have a name assigned to this particular machine. There. Now the machine will be assigned that host name by default whenever it boots up. Now, these are only valid really if you have a domain for your system or for your network rather if you do it would be like your host name dot whatever network so in this case if you were following this it would be tux dot home network and nis domain like it says users that don't need this will know that they don't need it. it. says to define that one too. 
And if you are on system D, this is how to configure the host name. We are not on system D, so don't worry about that. Additionally, if you are on system D and you need some additional help as far as specifying your host name or anything else related to that, hostname ctl double dash help or man one hostname ctl. Now, let us see if DHCP CD is already in place. DHCP CD, it is not. Therefore, we shall merge DHCP CD. Once this is done, we need to set it up so DHCP CD runs by default. And it says to start DHCP CD service, but that doesn't really apply if you already have a network connection. I'm not entirely certain why this line is here. It does not really affect anything. And as far as system D goes, this right here is the command for system D. Obviously, like I said, you don't need to start it right now. So for system D, you don't you need to use you don't even need to use the double dash now command. So, RC update add DHCP CD default service DHCP CD added to default run level or run level default. Now it gives you some information as to net IFRC. To the best of my knowledge, this is an alternative method to specify static IPs, so on and so forth. We'll go ahead and enable this in any case. So net IFRC that was fairly quick now nano slash Etsy slash conf dot D slash net nano net now in here we could specify all of this stuff for static IPs, or we could just specify this right here. Because we're using DHCP CD. Additionally, I don't think I went over this before, but You'll note how this thing says ENO1. That's because this interface right here is ENO1. Here it says ETH0. Different drivers, I suppose, use different interface names. And that's pretty much how this whole thing actually works. Now. Let's go to cd dot dot slash init dot d. Now, you'll note once again that I said we have ENO1. It's telling us to create a symbolic link from net dot lo to net dot eth0. However, once again, since our network interface is ENO1, we will do ln dash s net dot lo to net dot ENO1. What does this do? It 
it creates a symbolic link to net.eno1. What we need to do after this is add that to the default run level. So rc-update add net.eno1 default added to run level default. Done. Now for the hosts file. We are not going to be configuring this under this particular configuration. However, with the host file, basically what this does is it causes any DNS request to be directed to a specific IP. If you want to black hole IP addresses or domain names rather, if you want to black hole domain names, for example, if you want to black hole google.com, you would put 127.0.0.1 google.com. Then you would never be able to access google.com. Cannot recommend this. However, if that's what you want, you can try it. Now, we need to set up a root password. There, I've set up my root password. And it gives you a recommended password. But don't actually use that password. Because like it says, alternatively, if no one else can see your terminal, now you can pick this as your password. But odds you're going to actually remember that, I would say slim to nil. Now, rc.conf. You don't really need to look at this. However, it does go through a lot of stuff that OpenRC needs in order to, well, initialize the system. Most of this stuff is commented out. As you can see, there's a whole lot of hash signs before each individual line. There's only about one, two, three, three lines that are not commented out. In the general sense, you don't have to worry about these. However, conf.d slash keymaps might change your experience a little bit. If you do not have a US keyboard, for example, you might need to put in keymap UK or something of that sort. I'm aware UK keyboards have a slightly different layout from the US keyboard. Additionally, I guess if you had a German keyboard, you'd put DE. If you had a French keyboard, you'd put in FR, so on and so forth. I think the rest of this is fairly self-explanatory. So I'm just going to leave that as is. It seems to work just fine for me. If the wrong key map is selected, weird results will come up when typing on the keyboard. Those weird results will mainly be that your keys will be in different locations. That's the main result of it. So for example, if you have a German keyboard, I believe that's uh, Q-W-E-R-T-Z. And if you apply the German keyboard in place of the American keyboard, your Y key is going to be Z instead. Now, if hardware clock is not using UTC, then it is necessary to set clock equals local under slash etsy slash conf.d slash hw clock. 
Let's check out that file real quick. It looks like it's set to clock UTC, so we don't need to change anything. However, like say if you are dual booting with Windows, which I do not recommend by the way, if you are dual booting with Windows, you should set clock to local. I think you should probably also set clock to local if you're using a VM, but I'm not entirely certain on that. Don't have much experience with running Gen 2 under a VM. Additionally, there are commands here for system D, which we are not going to be using because we are not using system D for this particular installation. We've got system D dash first boot prompt setup machine ID, system control preset all, preset mode equals enable only, and system control preset all. These are just commands that you have to run in order to get the system initialized for system D. Let's go to installing system tools. You should probably install system logger unless you are under system D. As far as I'm aware, system D has its own system logger, so you don't really need to worry about that. However, emerge syslog D. Like it says, to install the system logger of choice, emerge it. On OpenRC, the default is RC update, so on and so forth. SysKlogD does not install a systemd unit, so systemd users either need to use the journal, which is built into systemd, or a different syslog daemon. RC update add syslog d default. And that service has been added to the default run level. A cron daemon. Emerge C R O N I E. I'm spelling that out because if I did not spell that out, a future program that we will be merging could confuse a few people. This apparently has a few things that it needs to install before actually installing the cron daemon. Don't worry too much about that. We'll just wait for that to actually finish. There we go. RC update add Crony default added to default run level. Next one is for file indexing. I'm not going to install file indexing. However, if you do, like it says, it can provide faster file location capabilities and the program it recommends is mlocate. Once this is installed, I believe you actually need to enable it as it shows right here or right here if you're using system D. Next up is remote access. Now SSHD is installed by default on all of these systems. So RC update add SSHD default. Would help if I would type things correctly. Now, one thing I should say about SSHD is that there are certain cases where you will need to use SSHD. Those specific cases would be if for whatever reason the graphics does not initialize properly. If the graphics does not initialize properly, then you will need to SSH into the system so that you can have some sort of interface. Now, there is an alternative to that if your system has, happens to have a serial terminal, you can enable a serial console in your init tab file. Or on system D, you can enable it using this command right here. 
Let's take a look at the init tab file. Last slash Etsy slash init tab. There are a number of serial consoles specified here. A number of terminals and serial consoles, I should say. And if you happen to have a serial interface on your machine, you can enable it here. It does say TTYS0 right here. If you happen to have a USB to serial adapter, you can use that using TTYUSB0, 1, 2, 3, so on and so forth. Those will not apply to most users, though. File system tools. These are also important. Let us check and see if we have the proper file system tools. I have to check for what the name of the tool is in order to make sure that I'm getting the name right because these tools are honestly confusing. Some of them are named tools, some of them are named utils, some of them are named progs, and I can never keep track of which one is which. However, let us do ls slash var slash db slash repos slash gen2 slash sys dash fs. This is a list of all of the file system utilities that it has available. One of them is fuse. This is for file system and user, and user space. Yeah. Another one is Riser 4 progs and Riser FS progs. These are if you're using the Riser FS, which is more or less deprecated. There's UDF tools. And there's ZFS over here. And a number of other file systems which might be relevant to you. However, as it says over here, ext4, the e2fs progs actually covers ext2, 3, and 4. If you're using xfs, it's xfs progs. If you're using ricerfs, which I cannot recommend at this point, uh, ricerfs progs, jfs, jfs utils. VFAT, DOSFS tools, ButterFS, BTRFS dash progs, and ZFS is just ZFS. As you can see, there's a pretty good reason why I get confused as to the names of these things. There is zero consistency as to what they are called. It says, as far as networking tools, installing a DHCP client. It recommends DHCP CD, but we've already installed. DHCP CD. If you recall from the, I believe it was in this previous section. Yeah, right here. We've already installed DHCP CD. So we don't need to worry about that one. Now, if you happen to be on dial up or ADSL or anything else that requires PPPoE, you should probably install this package right here. If you are accessing a wireless network, you need these two packages right here. IW is for just wireless access, and WPA supplicant is used for WPA and WPA2 access. The last part we need to get on to doing is configuring the bootloader. Now, under configuring the bootloader, 
it gives you a number of options. The default option is Grub, which is perhaps the most universal option to be using for any Linux install. The other options it gives is L-I-L-O. Some pronounce this LILO. However, what it stands for is, as it says right here, Linux Loader. Depending on how you pronounce Linux, some pronounce it Linux, some pronounce it Linux. Just depends on where you're from, but you would pronounce the first two characters as you would pronounce it in Linux. So I'd pronounce it Lilo. If you pronounce it Linux, you'd pronounce it Lilo. So on and so forth. That's kind of irrelevant though. EFI Boot Manager is another way for EFI systems to get booted a little bit faster. It's marginally faster than using Grub. However, it's a lot more rigid in how it operates. Otherwise, you have SysLinux, which I have very little experience, but apparently it supports MBR, EFI, and PXE network boot. So, what we are going to be doing is we are going to be using the default grub. So, emerge dash PVT grub. Just so it shows us everything that it's going to be installing. It looks like it's going to be installing libpng, mandoc, freetype, EFI var, EFI boot manager, which as you recall, is another one of these boot options, and Grub itself. We're going to go ahead and install this. It may take a minute or so. But let's go over what we need to do after installing it. It says echo Grub platforms EFI 64 to slash etsy slash portage slash make dot conf and then tells you to emerge sysboot grub. I'm going to get back to that in just a second because we don't actually need to do that. EFI 64 is in modern setups enabled by default. You don't need to worry about that. If you use emerge double dash ask verbose it will show you that it is emerging with Grub Platform's EFI64 set by default. And if it is not, then you need to enable this. And it is emerging Grub right now. And as it says, if Grub was somehow merged without enabling Grub Platform's EFI 64, the line shown above, you can redo it by using emerge update new use Grub. And it's still configuring. Once this is done, we have two different options. If you're using BIOS, you would simply use this first option right here, grub install slash dev slash SDA. No problem. If you are using UEFI, that would involve using this right here. It's still going. But once the grub install has been done, as per this line right here, you will need to run this line right here. What this line tells it to do is it generates a configuration and outputs that configuration to boot grub grub.cfg. 
It also recommends that you do not manually edit this particular configuration. You can if you know what you're doing, but odds are you're going to screw something up. That's just kind of a nine times out of 10 thing. Let's give this thing just a minute, just to be sure EFI 64 is enabled. That appears to be a default option, so we do not need to enable this. Now, let's go back to here. Ensure that boot is mounted. You do not want to do this without boot mounted, so run the mount command, make sure boot is mounted. If it is not mounted, this will go sideways real quick. So, grub install double dash target equals x86 underscore 64 dash EFI double dash EFI dash directory equals slash boot. Installation finished, no error reported. It does give you some information as to what to do if there are errors reported. However, it appears that no errors were reported in this particular circumstance. Now, just for funsies, I'm going to show you what the grub make config would do. Like I said, it says do not edit this file. You can edit the file if you know what you're doing, but most people don't. This is the file that it would put out for the boot options. As you can see, we've got a menu entry for Gentoo GNU slash Linux with Linux 51580 Gentoo class Gentoo class GNU Linux class GNU so on and so forth and it gives a number of different things for that and it's also got a recovery mode uncertain what exactly that does so from here we take this line right here and we put it in there there the entry has been added to the bootloader and let us move on it says rebooting the system it recommends exit CD U mount U mount reboot. You don't need to do all this U-mount stuff. It'll do it by default. So just exit out of the CH root environment. Exit. And then you can run reboot. Just like that. But before that, let's go over to finalizing. We're going to be in the next segment. This is going to be the last segment for the install series. We need to add users. We need to do a little bit of disk cleanup, and that's just about it. So, let's go ahead and reboot. This is going to be the end of this particular segment. See you in the next one.